Quest for the Grail is a game of adventure in the days of King Arthur. Your goal is to unify the fragmented nations of the British Isles, and through virtuous rule establish the Holy Kingdom of Lowgrass. You play a king who acquires land to expand his kingdom, and commands knights who can seek the ultimate glory of the Holy Grail. Only the Grail can heal the wounds of a war-torn Britain, and put the true king on his throne. You play cards from your court deck to build a kingdom, and gather knights to defend your realm. The domains you control generate power which you use to maintain your knights and retainers. Each player has a quest deck from which you can select quests for your knights to undertake. As knights overcome quests, they advance in valor. Once one of your knights has achieved 12 valor, you can declare that he is undertaking a quest for the Grail. Other players may pool their resources to attempt to stop him. If the questing knight overcomes those obstacles, he has achieved the Grail, and you have won the game. Quest for the Grail can be played solo or competitively with multiple players, but for this rules video we will be going over examples from a one-on-one -on -one game. To set up the game, all players first shuffle their court deck, the one with a dog rampart on the back, and place it nearby. Players then shuffle their quest deck, the one with a unicorn rampart, and place it nearby as well. All players then draw 9 cards from their court deck to form a hand of cards, and turn the top card of their quest deck face up. These face-up quest cards are known as the active quest of each player. For combat, players should have at least two six-sided dice each. Finally, players roll a die to determine who goes first. Turns will progress clockwise from the starting player. Time in Quest for the Grail is measured in rounds, turns, and phases. A round is a complete set of player turns, from the start of your turn to the start of your next turn. A turn is when you draw and play new cards and do most of your actions. A phase is a part of a turn in which you do a specific type of action. Many cards have powers which last for one of these durations. Each player follows the same sequence of phases during their turn. During the draw phase, you will draw from your court deck. During the build and deployment phases, you may play domains to generate power, and deploy warriors to undertake quests. During the assignment phase, you may assign your warriors cards that will help them. In the upkeep phase, you will spend power to pay for warriors and other cards you may have that have upkeep costs. Then, during the challenge phase, each of your warriors may undertake quests, issue challenges, or undertake a quest for the grail. Finally, during the end of turn phase, some card effects may end and certain types of damage may be removed. After these phases, the turn will pass clockwise to the next player, who will go through the same set of phases. In this video, we will go over each phase in order, and go over the different card types when they are relevant for the phase. During the draw phase, draw a card from your court deck. There is no limit to how many cards you may have in your hand. If you are ever unable to draw a card because you have no cards left in your court deck, you lose immediately. Otherwise, after you draw, you may choose to turn up a new quest card from your quest deck, to replace your current active quest. The replaced quest will go into the quest discard pile. If you ever run out of quests, reshuffle your discarded quests and start over. During the build phase, you may put one domain card from your hand into play. Domains generate power which is used to pay for cards you have in play during your upkeep phase. Unless otherwise noted on the card, each domain generates one power. Domains are the lands in which the action of the game takes place, and can be identified by their type line underneath the art. They are also your main source of power, which is what you use to pay upkeep costs for many of the cards in play. Domains will also usually have other domains that they border, as written in their text box. These are used for certain card effects only, and do not impact if and how the domain can be played. If you have a king in play, each domain card you have in play for that king's kingdom produces one additional power each turn. It's important to note that domains are not considered unique, so all players may have multiple of the same domain in play. However, they may still only put one domain card from their hand into play per turn in the build phase. As the game goes on and you play more domains, warriors, and other types of cards, you will build an array of cards in front of you. The area in front of each player is their court area. The player's court deck, court discard pile, and court cards which are in play are laid out in the court area. When putting court cards into play, make sure you keep the relationship between warriors and the cards assigned to them clear. Choose an area adjacent to your court area as your quest area. Each player's quest deck, quest discard pile, and active quest card are placed in this quest area. Cards in the court area or quest area are considered to be in play for the purposes of rules and card text.
In the deployment phase, you may put any number of warrior cards from your hand into play. While there is no limit to how many you may play, warriors have an upkeep cost that you must pay during the upkeep phase, and neglecting or not being able to do so will cause that warrior to be discarded. Additionally, most warriors are unique cards, which means only one of them can be in play at a time between all players. However, you may still play a warrior already in play, but this will begin a challenge of title which will be covered later. Warriors are played during your deployment phase and remain in play until something causes them to be discarded. Warriors include knights, kings, and other fighting characters. All warriors share the same general structure. A warrior's upkeep cost is found in the top left corner. This is how much power must be paid each turn, including the warrior's turn that he has played, to keep him in play. To the left and right of the text box, each warrior has four distinct characteristics. Prowess represents martial skill and the ability to land blows. Strength represents physical strength and the ability to deal damage. Endurance is the warrior's ability to withstand hardship and damage. And finally, Valor represents a warrior's virtue, renown, and purity of spirit. Warriors also have a text box that may list additional abilities and effects that the warrior has, and some of these could change the warrior's characteristics. Additional cards like events, companions, and rewards will also usually change these characteristics as well. Valor is unique among the characteristics as it will be modified without the use of cards, and will rise and fall based on the actions taken by the warrior during the challenge phase, and spent to play rewards from hand onto the warrior. Changes in Valor should be kept track of with counters or dice. If a warrior's valor ever goes below zero, the warrior is discarded. Additionally, a warrior may not spend valor if he has zero valor. There are four main things which can cause a warrior to be slain. These are not paying upkeep for the warrior, receiving a mortal wound in combat, losing a challenge of title, and having a total valor of less than zero. Most of these situations will be covered in detail later, but it's important to note that in all cases, a slain warrior is discarded along with any rewards, vows, companions, and combat experience that were assigned to him. All warriors are unique cards unless the card states otherwise. If a unique warrior is in play and someone plays the same warrior, a challenge of title is initiated. This will be explained in detail in the challenge phase section. Knights are the elite warriors of Arthurian legend. They have several special abilities which other warriors do not have, and they are the only warriors who can quest for the Grail, take Lady Companions, or receive Vow cards. They also have the Knightly Healing ability, which allows them to remove damage by spending Valor. This will be explained in detail later. Kings are considered kings and also knights, and as a result have all of the abilities of knights. Kings increase their player's power based on their land holdings. If you have a king in play, each domain card you have in play for his kingdom produces one additional power. King cards may also have special, additional game-winning conditions. It's important to note that kings and knights are the only kinds of warriors that can quest for the grail, which, if done so successfully, wins the game. Warriors who are not knights, and by extension not kings, do not have the special abilities of knights, but also do not have their chivalric obligations. During the challenge phase, they cannot issue or be the object of a challenge of honor, and they can issue a mortal challenge without a valor penalty. They also cannot have lady companions or quest for the grail. During the assignment phase, you may assign a companion, vow, or reward card of value 0 from your hand to any warrior you have in play. Each warrior can only receive one assigned card per assignment phase. Rewards, except for vows and combat experience and non-lady companions, may be transferred from one warrior to another during this phase. Receiving a transferred card counts as a warrior's assignment for that turn. The courts of Arthurian legend abounded with beautiful ladies whose favors knights vied for. Unlike other companions which may be assigned to any warrior, ladies may only be assigned to knights. Ladies are considered unique unless otherwise indicated on the card, and knights may only have one lady companion assigned. Other companions are played similarly during your assignment phase, and also remain in play until something causes them to be discarded. Other companions are retainers, friends, and even lovers associated with a warrior. Companions typically support the warrior with bonuses and special abilities. However, as a trade-off, some companions may add to their warrior's upkeep cost each turn. Unlike ladies, any number of these companions may be assigned to any warrior. Companions who are not ladies may be transferred to another warrior or discarded during the assignment phase, and receiving a companion by transfer counts as a warrior's one assignment for that turn.
Reward cards are structured similarly to companions, but have a valor cost listed on them in the top left corner. This determines how and when they may be assigned. Reward cards with a value of 0 can be assigned to any warrior during the assignment phase, and remain in play until they are destroyed, discarded, or that warrior leaves the game. Reward cards with a higher value than 0 can be assigned to any warrior as the reward for a successful quest, which will be covered later. Additionally, some rewards may add to their bearer's upkeep cost. Except for combat experience, all reward cards with a value greater than 0 are unique cards. And, like other non-warrior unique cards, you may not put another copy of those cards into play if one is already in play. Most reward cards represent weapons and armor that your warriors equip during their journey. These will generally add bonuses in combat. Unless otherwise noted, a warrior may only be assigned one armor, one weapon, one shield, and one horse at a time. Vows are another type of reward card. These alter the characteristics of knights and usually trade off some inconvenient restrictions for useful advantages. Vows may only be assigned during the assignment phase. Unlike some other reward and companion cards, vows cannot be transferred from one knight to another. During the upkeep phase, you spend power to pay for warriors and other cards with upkeep costs. Your available power is equal to the total generated by the domains you have in play, plus one additional power per domain if you have that domain's king in play, plus power from any other source. From this total, you pay the upkeep costs of any cards that you have in play. Discard any card whose upkeep was not paid. A player may choose not to pay a card's upkeep even if they have sufficient power. During the challenge phase, each of your warriors may undertake a quest, issue a challenge, undertake a quest for the grail, or do nothing. Only one of these actions may be taken by a warrior each turn. While there are a few different types of challenges that warriors may issue, all challenges and quest undertaking follow the same combat structure. Combat is broken up into combat exchanges, and in each combat exchange, both participants make an attack roll to attempt to damage the other participant. When one of the participants is a creature or knight quest, any player may roll the dice for the quest other than the controller of the questing warrior. Combat exchanges are made up of two primary steps, attack and check for mortal wounds. During the first step, attack, both combatants make their attacks at the same time. A warrior's attack is made by rolling two six-sided dice and adding his total prowess. The combatant with the higher total hits his opponent, while the combatant with the lower total misses. If the totals are tied, both combatants hit. When a combatant hits his opponent, he does damage equal to his strength. Then, after any hits or misses, during the check for mortal wounds step, both participants check to see if their accumulated damage equals or exceeds their endurance. If it does, then they are considered to be mortally wounded and defeated. If neither participant received a mortal wound, the combat continues, going to another combat exchange. If one or both the participants are mortally wounded, then the combat ends. At the end of combat, and depending on what kind of combat it was, determine the outcome and any rewards or penalties. Let's go over the different kinds of combats and challenges warriors can issue, and how to undertake quests. Formal combats are fought between individual warriors under special restrictions. Formal combats are not fought to the death, and are usually fought to settle a dispute between the two warriors. The three main types of formal combat are challenges of honor, challenges of victory, and challenges of title. During a formal combat, no other warriors or companions may use their abilities to aid the participants of the combat, except for increases in characteristics given by ladies assigned to the combatants. Rewards and vows assigned to participants may be used in a formal combat. Event and combat action cards may also be used, but spells may not. Let's go over each type of formal combat. A Challenge of Honor may be issued by any knight to any other warrior in play during the challenging player's challenge phase. This requires an action by that knight. Knights who challenge unworthy opponents lose valor when they do so. An unworthy opponent is any warrior who is not a knight, or any knight whose prowess is three or more less than the prowess of your knight. A knight who issues an unworthy challenge immediately loses two valor. After a challenge has been issued, the challenged warrior has the option to decline the challenge. If a knight declines a challenge made by an opponent, the knight loses 2 valor. A warrior who is not a knight may always decline a challenge of honor without a valor penalty. 
While fighting a challenge of honor, once one of the warriors has taken damage equal to or greater than his endurance, he is considered defeated. If both warriors are defeated simultaneously, neither warrior is considered to have been victorious or defeated, and neither gains or loses anything. Warriors defeated in a challenge of honor are not discarded, and all damage received is restored once a victor is determined. The victor in a challenge of honor gains one valor, while the defeated warrior loses one valor and must discard one reward assigned to him of the victor's choice except for combat experience and vows. If this loss of valor reduces a warrior's valor below zero, he is discarded. Here's an example of a challenge of honor. On their turn during the challenge phase, the player announces that Sir Balin Le Sauvage is using his action to issue a challenge of honor to the opposing Sir Bliant of Gales. First, they check if the challenged opponent is worthy or not. The challenged opponent is a knight and his prowess is not three or more less than the knight issuing the challenge, so he is considered worthy and doesn't cause the knight issuing the challenge to lose two valor. The opposing player announces that Sir Bliant does not decline the challenge. If they did, their knight would lose two valor and the challenge would be prevented. Now, the challenge of honor begins. Both sides roll two six-sided dice and add their warrior's prowess to the total. For the first roll, Sir Balin rolls a 7, adding his prowess of 6 for a total of 13. Sir Bliant rolls an 8 and adds his prowess of 4 for a total of 12. For this attack, Sir Balin's total is higher, so he is the only one that hits. He deals an amount of damage equal to his strength value, which is 3, to Sir Bliant. As Sir Bliant has an endurance of 5, he is not yet mortally wounded, so both sides roll to attack again. This time, Sir Balin rolls a 5, plus his 6 from his prowess, coming to a total of 11. Sir Bliant rolls an 11, plus the 4 from his prowess for a total of 15. Sir Bliant's total is higher, so his attack hits for his strength to Sir Balin. Sir Balin's endurance is also 5, so he is not yet mortally wounded. Both sides roll for attack again. Sir Balin rolls a 6, and Sir Bliant rolls a 3, for a total of 12 and 7 respectively. Sir Balin hits for his strength value of 3, and Sir Bliant's endurance is brought to below 0, meaning he has been defeated. In a challenge of honor, defeated warriors are not discarded, but instead lose one valor and discard a non-combat experience or vow reward of the victor's choice. Additionally, the victor of the challenge gains one valor, and all damage dealt is restored. The challenge is now completed, and the current player's challenge phase proceeds. When you intend to win by an alternative victory condition listed on a king card, you issue a challenge of victory during your turn. During the next round of play, each player may have one of his knights declare a challenge of honor against your king, with no risk or loss of valor. If your king or his champion is defeated in any one of these challenges, your king is discarded and you have not won the game. If you are not defeated during this round and all the required conditions have been met, you win the game at the start of your next turn. Additionally, no player may declare a quest for the grail or victory by another means during this round. A challenge of title occurs when a unique warrior is brought into play who is a duplicate of another unique warrior already in play, or when a king is played who reigns over the same domain as another king already in play. Warriors who are not unique do not initiate a challenge of title, but non-unique kings still initiate a challenge of title with any king who rules over that same domain. If you play a unique warrior whose duplicate is in your own court, it does not result in a challenge of title. You just discard the one who was played first. All challenges of title take place during the challenge phase, before any actions are taken by any knight. A challenge of title is fought like a challenge of honor, but produces very different results. A warrior overcome any challenge of title is immediately discarded and cannot be healed or kept in play by any means. The victor of a challenge of title gains no valor, but does get to remain in play. If combat results in a tie, both combatants are discarded. In a challenge of title, both combatants are considered defenders. So, if they are kings, they may choose champions to fight for them. If a champion is defeated defending another warrior in a challenge of title, the warrior who was challenged is discarded, not the champion. Champions will be explained in detail in the Special Combat Options section. Unlike challenges, Mortal Kombats are fought to the death. In most cases, Mortal Kombat occurs when a warrior undertakes a creature or knight quest, or issues a mortal challenge. Warriors may use any aid possible without any restrictions such as those imposed by formal combats. Mortal combats are resolved in the same way as formal combats. In a mortal combat, when a warrior has received damage equal to or greater than his endurance, he is mortally wounded. When at least one participant is mortally wounded, the combat ends. At the end of the combat phase, all mortally wounded combatants are discarded, unless they are healed. 
If the combat was between a warrior and a quest, and the quest is mortally wounded, the warrior has overcome the quest, even if he also received a mortal wound. A mortally wounded warrior must be healed before he may receive valor or a reward at the end of a combat. Warriors who take damage, but are not mortally wounded, are healed at the end of the turn in which they are damaged. A mortal challenge may be issued by any warrior to any other warrior in play during the challenging player's challenge phase, at the cost of an action for that warrior. A knight who issues a mortal challenge immediately loses 2 valor. Warriors who are not knights may issue a mortal challenge without penalty. A mortal challenge may not normally be declined, and, as the name implies, it is fought as a mortal combat. Quest cards represent difficulties and trials which warriors undertake to prove themselves. They include such things as renegade knights, monstrous creatures, supernatural dangers, and even moral dilemmas. Knight and creature challenges have appropriate combat characteristics listed on them. Other cards have descriptions of their effects. All quest cards have a valor value found in the bottom right corner. When a warrior overcomes a quest, he gains this amount of valor. When receiving valor from a quest in this way, you may keep that valor, or you may decline it to play a reward from your hand on the questing warrior. The reward must have a value equal to or less than the valor you would have gained. Alternatively, you may decline the valor to draw an additional card from your court deck. When you draw a quest card, place it on the top of the quest deck face up. That card remains in play until someone overcomes it. When one of your quests is overcome, immediately turn up a new quest. You may also choose to draw a new quest card to replace your current active quest at the start of your turn. If you ever run out of quests, reshuffle your discarded quests and start over. Each of a player's warriors may undertake any active quest from any player's quest deck during their challenge phase. And combat with quests is always considered a mortal combat. When a warrior is mortally wounded at the same time he overcomes a quest, and is healed at the end of the combat, he still receives the valor or reward for overcoming that quest. Remember that rewards with a value greater than zero, except for combat experience, are considered unique cards. Combat experience is a special type of reward card. These always have a value of one and can only be assigned as the result of a victorious quest. Combat experience cannot be transferred from one knight to another, and cannot be discarded as the result of a defeat in a challenge of honor. If a warrior fails to overcome a quest, all damage that quest has received is removed at the end of combat, with the exception of dolorous damage, which will be covered later. Here is an example of a knight attempting a quest. During their challenge phase, the player announces that Sir Balin Le Sauvage would like to undertake a quest. Sir Balin has an Axe of Cleaving attached that will help him in combat, providing an extra 4 strength but also minus 1 prowess. The player chooses between the current active quests, and picks the quest card Goblin to undertake. Remember that combat for quests is always considered a mortal combat, so the player rolls 2 dice and has their opponent roll 2 for the quest creature. Sir Balin rolls an 8, adding 6 from his characteristic and subtracting 1 from his axe, for a total of 13. The goblin rolls a 5 and adds their 6 prowess for a total of 11. Sir Balin has the higher total so he hits with his attack for a total of 3 strength, plus an additional 4 from his axe. This is exactly enough to subtract the goblin's endurance to 0, so the quest is successfully overcome. The card is now discarded, being replaced immediately from the same quest deck. The victorious warrior is rewarded the valor written on the bottom right of the quest card, which in this case is 1. At this time, the player has the option to keep the valor or immediately spend it on a reward card of equal or less value. The player decides to keep the valor. The action for Sir Balin is now finished, and the challenge phase proceeds as normal. During your challenge phase, you may declare that one of your warriors who has a total valor of 12 or more is questing for the Grail. To achieve the Grail and win the game, he must overcome 3 quests in the same turn, and he must still have at least 12 valor at the end of his last quest. These quests must be chosen from among those which are revealed at the time the quest for the Grail is declared, or those which are revealed during the quest as the result of overcoming revealed quest cards. A knight who quests for the Grail gains no valor for the quests he overcomes, and if he is defeated by a quest during a quest for the Grail, he loses valor equal to the value of that quest. During the end of turn phase, cards whose effects last until the end of the turn are discarded, and any normal damage to warriors who are not mortally wounded is removed. After this phase, the current player's turn is over, and the turn passes to the next player clockwise, who likewise goes through each of the 7 phases of a turn and then the turn gets passed clockwise once more. Play then continues until a player successfully quests for the grail or wins through an alternate victory condition.
some warriors and companions are also enchanters. This will usually be written as a keyword in their text box and will precede a number. This number represents that character's enchanter rating, and determines how powerful of a spell that enchanter can cast. Spells are cards that have a magic value that can be found in the top left corner. In order to play a spell, you must control a warrior or companion who is an enchanter with an enchanter rating equal to or greater than the magic value of the spell. Each enchanter may cast only one spell per round, but those spells may be cast at any time within a round, unless the card specifies otherwise. Casting a spell does not require an action from a warrior enchanter, or from a warrior to whom a companion enchanter is assigned. The duration of spells is variable, and is specified on the card. After the effects of the spell occur, or the duration runs out, the spell is discarded. Events represent things that can happen during your character's adventures. Usually they have specific effects which alter the play of the game, and last for a duration specified on the card. Most events work once, and are then discarded. When multiple conflicting events are played in sequence, the last card played takes precedence if they conflict. Combat actions represent specific tactics in combat, and they are similar to events. However, they are usually only played on your warriors, or on any other creature or warrior involved in combat on any player's turn. Like events, combat actions have a limited duration specified on the card, and are discarded at the end of that period. For example, during a challenge of honor, a player announces that they will use the Vital Blow Combat Action card. The card reads, plus two strength for attack after roll is made. They play the card after a successful hit has happened, and add an additional two strength from the card to their strength total. After the effect has happened, the card is put into its owner's discard pile. Keep in mind that events and combat actions generally don't have any restrictions on being played beyond those specified on the cards themselves, and they get discarded after their effect occurs. Some warriors have the ability to give aid or receive aid from other warriors. Aid acts as an increase in combat to a specific characteristic. A warrior who can give aid may use his action for a turn to add one of the specified characteristic for any other warrior controlled by that player for that turn. No warrior may receive more points in aid than their starting valor. And no warrior may give aid to a warrior whose total valor is lower than his own. Aid may never be used during a formal combat. During combat, after any combat exchange, a warrior may request that his opponent allow him to yield to end the combat. A warrior may only request to yield once per combat. In a formal combat, if the opponent accepts, the yielding warrior loses one valor, and the accepting warrior gains a valor. If a warrior asks to yield in a mortal combat, his opponent may choose to give him a mortal wound immediately, and quests will always choose to do so. Knights are expected to allow opponents to yield in combat. If a knight does not allow an opponent to yield in a formal or mortal combat, he loses two valor. Non-knight warriors are not penalized if they do not allow an opponent to yield. Combatants in a challenge of title may not yield. When challenged to a formal combat, a king may choose a champion to fight in his place. The champion may be any other warrior belonging to the player who controls the king. If the champion is victorious, treat his king as the victor. Likewise, if the champion is defeated, treat his king as defeated. A champion may not be used in a mortal combat. In a challenge of title, both combatants are considered defenders, and thus may designate champions. Some cards have an armor value listed on them. This is the amount of protection that the card gives in combat against all damage sustained. Each time a warrior, creature, quest, or knight quest with armor is damaged, the damage received is reduced by the amount of the armor. Armor from multiple sources is cumulative, adding to give a total armor value for the warrior or quest. Knightly healing allows a knight to heal himself by spending one valor. When a warrior is healed, all damage is removed. Or if he was mortally wounded, he is no longer mortally wounded. A knight may only use knightly healing at the end of a combat, and it heals all damage at that time, regardless of the amount of damage or the condition of the warrior. It is also the only way to heal damage before the end of a turn. Knightly healing does not change the outcome of the combat, but it prevents that knight from being discarded. If at any point during the game a warrior's valor falls below zero, he is immediately discarded. Abilities which enhance endurance are not considered healing, and are not restricted in the same ways. During a quest for the Grail, a knight who has survived a quest, but has taken damage, may spend valor for knightly healing before his next quest. Additionally, during a quest for the Grail, if a knight receives a mortal wound, he has failed that quest for the Grail, even if he can heal himself with knightly healing. 
Dolorous damage is damage which is not removed by normal means. It cannot be healed with nightly healing, and does not go away at the end of a turn in which it is dealt, even if the dolorous damage was dealt in a formal combat. Dolorous damage can only be removed by cards which specifically indicate that they can be used against it. Any warrior who receives a dolorous mortal wound is discarded. Deck building in the quest for the Grail follows a few simple rules. Your quest deck must consist of at least 10 quest cards, but those can only contain no more than two of a single quest. When building your quest deck, keep in mind that your quests may be undertaken by any player's warriors. Your court deck must have at least 40 court cards. Keep in mind that you should have enough domains to pay the upkeep cost of your warriors and any other cards, and enough rewards to help your warriors overcome quests or fulfill any alternate victory conditions that you may have. Quest for the Grail can be played solo for amusement or to test out deck design ideas. To play a recommended mode of solo play, pick at least 20 quest cards at random and turn a new one up at the end of every turn. If you run out of quests without achieving the Grail, you have lost the game. This concludes the rules video. Linked in the description are additional rules and resources that should answer any further questions that you may have, and card images to get started playing. Thanks for watching.